Добрый день. Сегодня в гостях в программе «Экономикс» профессор Института аграрной политики и рыночных исследований Гистонского университета, доктор экономических наук, теперь уже почетный доктор Казанского университета Петр Михаил Шмидц. Профессор Шмидц, мы рады приветствовать вас в нашем университете. Примите поздравления по поводу присуждения вам звания почетный доктор Казанского университета. One of the leading Russian uh, universities, which is very famous also internationally. Спасибо. В первой части нашего интервью хотелось бы задать несколько вопросов по лекции, которую вы прочитали вчера в актовом зале. И первый вопрос касается того графика, на котором были отражены цены на сельскохозяйственную продукцию за последние 40-50 лет. Видно, что волатильность на этом рынке была всегда очень высокая, но в последнее время, как вы отметили, с 2007 года эта волатильность увеличилась. И чем характеризует такая неустойчивость цен в последнее время? I think we should differentiate between the level of prices and the volatility. The level of prices indeed has exploded in 2007 and 2008. Then we had a big recession after the financial crisis in the world. The prices went down. And after that in 2010 and 2011, we had another high level and explosion of prices. So this concerns the level. And economists are asking what is uh, driving force behind that. And I gave some ideas what the driving force is, and we did some empirical research on this. Concerning the volatility is a little bit different, looking at the development of volatility, of the changing of the variability of prices, one cannot observe a, an increasing trend of volatility. The volatility exists. It's not that small. It's uh, between 20 and uh, up to 50 percent changing prices from month to month or from year to year. Uh, but uh, in general, the band uh, Uh, the upper and lower price band of this uh, volatility remains the same uh, on the world market at least. Uh, this is quite different for internal markets like the European Union market where we have for a long time uh, a protection of farmers from international uh, uh, roundabouts and uh, uh, changes of prices because we have market orders with intervention activities of the state and this leads to a very stable situation. So the European farmers complain at the moment that they have now, after we have reformed the agricultural policy, we have now, or they have now a higher level of volatility. This is true, but the level itself on the world market has not changed. Вы также отметили, что цены на нефть и цены на сельскохозяйственную продукцию коррелируют. Чем отличаются те периоды нефтяных кризисов и кризисов на сельскохозяйственных продовольственных рынках, которые возникали, допустим, в 70-х, 80-х, 2000-х годах? Есть ли между ними какая-либо связь, либо это совершенно разные, совершенно отделенные друг от друга кризисы? I think there was a time when they were not correlated so much. But uh, in newer times when agriculture became more capital intensive and so production needs more outside and other inputs from other industries, like fertilizer, for example, which is heavily influenced by energy prices. To produce fertilizer, you uh, need oil for that and oil products and even other inputs of agriculture like uh, petrol or fuel. Uh, you have the oil as input of agriculture and food production. And since uh, oil prices are increasing, then you have an increase of your input cost. And that means that you have to give this further to the output side. And this means that also the agriculture produce is becoming more expensive. So this is certainly one uh, channel, one path of uh, linkage. The other is uh, biofuel production. If you have high oil prices, fossil energy prices, then it becomes more attractive to produce uh, and your renewable resources and renewable energy from wind, from, from the sun, and also from biomass. And uh, so this became more attractive to use biofuels of the so-called first generation, to use corn, to use wheat, to use sugar, uh, sugar beet. Uh, sometimes in Brazil, uh, it's a different kind of sugar production, but you can use all these food uh, instead of giving to the people and consumption 
put it in the energy production, and this also have an influence on the uh, uh, on the prices for commodities because they are taken away from the food uh, aspect uh, to the uh, energy aspect. Говоря о последствиях высокой волатильности цен, вы также отметили, что необходима жесткая регулятивная политика. На чем эта политика должна основываться? Yeah, volatility is something which is inherent in market orders in general. So one should not fear too much about volatility because, and uh, my opinion is that even the policymakers should not too much uh, uh, emphasize on this aspect because entrepreneurs in general are clever enough to cope with uh, uncertainty and risk. And they had, a, they had a, a lot of internal, company internal and company uh, external mechanism to cope with risk. For example, to uh, make a contract with an insurance company to hedge the risk or to go onto the uh, commodity or exchange rate future markets where you can hedge the risk. Or you can save some money for the bad times. Uh, if you have good times, seven years, and you can save some money for the bad times. And uh, you have even internal possibilities to uh, adjust to risk. For example, looking at farmers, they can uh, rely on a, a broader spectrum of crops. Uh, not every crop is falling in the price. Some, uh, sometimes uh, they are lagging a little bit behind, and there are some possibilities to uh, grow uh, crops which are good in prices and so they can adjust a little bit to be not too specialized to produce not, not only corn for example and if the corn price went down then they have troubles so to broaden their crop uh, rotation and a little bit broader so uh, finally if uh, certainly if you have a certain amount of volatility it might be the case that the state could uh, intervene but But one golden rule of intervention in such field is that you should not uh, go into detail of the market uh, mechanism. You should uh, perhaps help the people uh, in the form of direct payments and not to intervene in the market and the price formation because whenever you intervene in the price formation you have policy objective behind that and that very often means you follow distributional aspects to favor some consumers or to favor producers and you uh, do not uh, really solve the problem of volatility yourself. Исследуя трансмиссию мировых цен на международных сельскохозяйственных рынках на внутренней, вы отметили, что она составляет лишь только около 18-20%. В чем причина такой низкой ценовой трансмиссии? Yeah, this is certainly an interesting question. If you look at the industrialized countries and even transition countries like Russia, for a long time, besides the current situation, we come to this later perhaps, Uh, all these industrialized countries have shown a more open, more openness of international engagement and trade. Imports and exports have taken place. So, on the one hand, all these countries belonging to the WTO, the World Trade Organization, the objective is to open their trade, to open their markets, to have an. Uh, uh, an the division of labor between nations and so on and so forth and they benefit from this openness. Many developing countries fear the international competitive uh, uh, competition from other industries, from other countries and they uh, have a tendency to close their borders and to run an own trade policy whenever the prices are down. They Uh, increase uh, their uh, import duties whenever the prices are high, they alleviate their import duties, so they intervene uh, at, the, at the border, uh, uh, distorting the trade flows, and they even intervene in the currency market, uh, and they define uh, local currencies uh, which have not the real Uh, equilibrium price vis-a-vis -vis other cu currencies, but this is a shadow price, something like that the uh, uh, government wishes uh, to have. And so this means that all these uh, movements of the world market are not uh, going one-to-one -one into the domestic market because 
uh, own interest, single interest, very distorted interest, uh, forbid uh, the, uh, the transmission of prices of the world market. And most of the cases they are corrupt elites in those countries, not governments who want to benefit uh, the whole population, but they take their cash for their own and their families and their clans. So they are not able to let the people participate in the, in the process of the world market. So this is, in my opinion, the most uh, important problem in the world. Спасибо. И хотелось бы задать еще один вопрос по поводу вашего исследования. В чем будет заключаться дальнейшее исследование этой темы неустойчивости цен на международных сельскохозяйственных рынках? На какие моменты вы будете обращать еще больше внимания в дальнейшем? What is certainly important uh, to get an idea uh, about the interrelation between commodities. And uh, I think we, although we did some research on that, I think there is still space to go further and to elaborate a little bit further with more methodologies, with different methodologies to ver verify what we have found so far and what is done in the literature. What is very difficult, for example, to uh, clearly show also with econometrics what the influence of policy is. Uh, the data availability is not that good. You need data from months to months in order to uh, research on the direct intervention of policymakers into the market. And you need uh, these uh, for every month. Then you can take a time series and can uh, detect causalities between the time series. So the database is very uh, in deficit in, in many of these cases, looking what is the impact of policy. And uh, this is certainly true for the trade policy. We know from some articles that uh, trade policy plays a big role, uh, but uh, in those articles only trade is uh, covered and not all the other influencing factors. And so we have to look in, in a ranking system what the policy uh, uh, effect is on different variables. Mm -hmm. Спасибо. Профессор Шмидц, также хотелось бы услышать несколько комментариев по поводу ситуации и актуального вопроса агропромышленного сектора в России. И первый вопрос будет касаться роли аграрных рынков в России на международной арене. Как она изменилась за последние 20-25 лет и какой перспективы ее развития в будущем? Russian agriculture and food system, I would also include the food system because in Germany we say you cannot understand the agriculture for its alone because the competitiveness is decided and the international competitiveness is decided at the end of the pipeline. The beginning of the pipeline is the input industry of agriculture, fertilizer, energy, uh, plant protection products and, and, and feed and so on and so forth. And you have agricultural production, then you have the whole trading system to collect and uh, market these raw materials. And then you have the industry, the uh, processing industry of food. And finally, you have all these alleviating services like banks, insurances, uh, marketing services and uh, uh, futures markets which make the uh, complete, uh, we call it food chain, competitive worldwide. So it's not agriculture which uh, is competing with other countries, agriculture of Germany against agriculture of Russia. It's a food chain uh, competing against each other and this is a very important aspect we have to consider. Coming back to your question, uh, I think uh, since uh, the entry of Russia into the WTO, the Russian government has decided to uh, be part of this international activity and uh, division of labor. And it seems to be that Russia is especially uh, has a comparative advantage in crop production. Uh, wheat, uh, soybeans uh, and corn. So all these crop products uh, are, I think, very interested, uh, interesting positions in the world situation. And uh, before we had this crisis and now the geopolitical uh, problems, uh, it was said that Ukraine, uh, Russia and Kazakhstan are the main suppliers of grains. And this might be a very interesting uh, direction of the agriculture in Russia. 
And uh, what is not that competitive, this was clear looking at the animal side of the production, meat and milk, and looking before you turned your uh, pol official policy, there were, were a lot of imports of animal products to the, uh, to the Russian uh, population. And so this is type of uh, international division of labor. Crop products for the world, and the world uh, uh, exports uh, animal products to Russia. And uh, looking at the whole uh, economy, I think Russia has other uh, uh, focuses and other uh, expertise in other industries where they can also survive. The whole gas and oil industry is very competitive, and the products out of it helicopters from Kazan, for example, and so on and so forth. So uh, let the economy, let the entrepreneurs decide what is internationally competitive. And so this is, was the situation before we had the uh, sanctions, the EU sanctions uh, and other countries for the EU uh, for the exports to Russia. And Russia responded with an import boycott on, uh, and I think all these boycotts and uh, restrictions on trade are bad, in my opinion. We should let the things open. And our industry in Germany, our agriculture and food industry says, oh, we wish that very soon all these sanctions are gone and are taken away and uh, that we can make our business and our mutual contracts with Russia. So this is an intensive wish of our industry. The government still thinks a little bit different. But OK, this is the government, uh, but the industry and the farmers for the food, for the whole business, it would be much better to have open borders mm -hmm. and to let them go and to let have an open competition on these things. And uh, to uh, summarize, I think Russian agriculture and food is very strong in crop production and less a comparative advantage in the animal production. Mm -hmm. Вы уже отметили политический аспект uh, вопроса сельскохозяйственных рынков России и мира. Все-таки, uh, если uh, смотреть на действительность, создает ли политическая ситуация в мире, которая сократила товарооборот между такими странами, как Россия, Украина, Турция, Европейский Союз, создает ли это возможность для внутреннего потребителя и действительно эффективного импортозамещения? Uh, I think uh, I think this is bad for consumers and producers as well. Uh, if you follow the consequences of these sanctions, that means for Russia that the food prices has increased a lot. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, it's uh, sometimes it's doubled. Also, in other countries where we have conflicts, uh, the food prices are very soon uh, affected. And now I think you have uh, higher food prices than two years uh, ago. So this is certainly something which uh, hurts uh, the uh, where, where consumers suffer, uh, certainly. Of course, you have different options to circumvent this problem a little bit. We had big problems, our farmers in Germany, for example, uh, one of the estimation of our farmers union what was that the farmers uh, lose one billion uh, euro uh, in uh, due to this sanction vis-a-vis -vis the Russian um, f food exports and so they are the losers the farmers in the food industry and they complain a lot about that and they ask the government to open uh, this situation again but uh, to be honest uh, our milk industry and also the meat industry were quite successful to compensate a little bit these export losses on the russian side and they exported more to the asian countries so the trade flows was circumventing and uh, as far as I know, even Russia has uh, other sources of uh, imports from other countries to compensate for the lack uh, for the deficit coming from Europe. So there are of, co there are of course some uh, adjustments on both sides, but all adjustments in the economy are not costless. So you have finally some people who uh, uh, do not benefit from this uh, situation. And then again, my message is let these borders open and uh, let the people and entrepreneurs engage uh, wherever they want and forget these sanctions and these import boycotts. This is a political thing. Uh, sometimes one can't understand, but I think finally one, one should uh, uh, trade together. And so this is to uh, the best of all. Спасибо. 
И в последней части нашего интервью хотелось бы обратить внимание на вопрос продовольственной безопасности и устойчивого развития. Согласно прогнозам, в 2050 году население Земли увеличится более чем, достигнет более чем 9 миллиардов человек. И для того, чтобы поддержать меняющийся рацион питания этих людей, нужно будет увеличить производство сельскохозяйственной продукции с 8,5 до почти 13,5 миллиардов тонн в год. На чем должна базироваться общая концепция устойчивого производства продовольствия и ведения сельскохозяйства для достижения таких целей? Economists have their ideas how to solve the problem. First of all, it's clear we have a population nearly till 10 billion people, might be even more. Uh, and uh, the question is how to let them survive. And uh, in that uh, context, the discussion of, of sustainability plays a big role. But pe many people forget, uh, and I will stress this point a little bit, Uh, the Brundtland Commission, which has established this definition of sustainable development for the world, for the economy, for agriculture, has three pillars of, uh, of sustainability, which have to be kept in mind. The first pillar is economic efficiency. Mm -hmm. Things should be economically efficient, and uh, this is the first goal mm -hmm. or first pillar. The second is it should be socially acceptable the working conditions for the people, the salaries and the uh, labor unions should protect the farmers or the laborers uh, from the capitalists. And the third is uh, environmental friendliness. So you should keep the environment in order, the air, the, the water, uh, the soils and so on and so forth. So these uh, three uh, elements or pillars are today uh, very much discussed. And some people think that you can reach everything simultaneously of these three things. My opinion is different. I think if you have not a very sound, a very healthy economic situation, then you can forget all the other things. Uh, looking at my country, Germany is very rich. They have a very good situation in economic terms. Nearly no labor unemployment, uh, really high uh, income and so on and so forth. Uh, everything is fine. Some, some things we can improve, of course, but most of the things are fine. And we can, we have the money and the willingness to pay a, a broad social network yeah, uh, to, to keep people above a poverty line. We can uh, spend money for improving the environment. We can spend so much money to f support the entrepreneurs doing and uh, environmental friendly production and so on and so forth. But at the very beginning, it is uh, the economic efficiency. And if we go with our message, some people, and I, I criticize so people, we go with our concept of sustainability to Africa, for example, or tell those people, please keep the environment intact and uh, keep social aspects uh, in mind. And at the same time, they are hungry and people uh, and some of their family staff, uh, then they do not believe what sustainability is. So you have to make them first uh, economically efficient and then you can sing. So this is the order in my point of view, the ranking order of these three pillars. And coming back to, uh, to the big problem of population growth and I think uh, one uh, important aspect is that Hunger and uh, food insecurity is not a matter of quantity in the world. It's a matter of purchasing power. People have not uh, enough purchasing power to buy the food. Food is available in other countries. And uh, look at some African countries. There is an interesting study of the World Bank titled with Africa can help feed Africa. So Africa can uh, itself help each other if you have a good infrastructure, if you trade uh, food between countries, and if there is a weather extreme or a drought in one country, another country can export in those, in those regions. So if you have a, f a flowing, a fluencing uh, trade uh, situation, then everybody can um, uh, benefit from this situation. And this is certainly uh, very important to have open trade also in this case for African countries and to let the people earn some income. 
and uh, then uh, you have enough purchasing power to, to buy the food from external sources. And finally, I would say for long decades, we have neglected the important role of agriculture of the farmers in many developing countries. If you look at the situation of farmers in Africa, sometimes also in Asian countries, you observe three important points which discriminate the farmers. You have a, a huge amount of export taxes of all their produce, which are exported coffee, bananas, um, maize, corn, whatever. Yeah, very often you have high export and production taxes. That means that the producers get only a small fraction of the international prices. The second is we have an overvalued uh, uh, currencies and that means that all tradable products are kept down in their prices. This is the second impact. And the third is that uh, many developing countries have a high tax on imported industrial products. And if you have such a distortion in your economy, that means all three sources discriminate against agriculture. And then it's, you should not be astonished that uh, most of the small farmers in African countries are subsistence farmers, just producing for their own needs and their own family and not looking at the market or at the population in the urban areas because they, they would only to survive uh, because there's no incentive at all. There's, the price is not enough to go to the market to earn some money, to buy some inputs from that. So the uh, farmers are kept into their own subsistence situation. And this is, uh, from my point of view, the most important reason for hunger and undernutrition in the world. Продовольственные и сельскохозяйственные организации Объединенных Наций сформулировали пять основных принципов, на которых должна основываться политика устойчивого развития и ведения сельского хозяйства. Один из этих принципов – это необходимость повышения устойчивости к внешним угрозам. Это экстремальное погодное явление, волатильность финансовых рынков, гражданские политические волнения. Все это нарушает стабильность сельского хозяйства. А какие меры, по вашему мнению, какие меры, практики, технологии необходимы для того, чтобы повысить устойчивость сельхозпроизводителей к этим внешним угрозам? I think, uh, coming back to open trade, the most important effect of stabilizing market is to have the first the possibility to stockpile to storage products, and you have to have a good infrastructure on that, uh, storing uh, goods over time and uh, uh, taking it from the storage if you have scarce situation and put it on the storage if you have a surplus of goods. So storage activities, sto storage uh, infrastructure is very important also on a regional level. But uh, uh, I think more important is open trade because what you can observe worldwide, if countries are closed, uh, sometimes natural closed like landlocked countries where no harbor is, no sea around, landlocked countries or where the governments close their countries because they uh, completely separate their own business and their national business from international business. So these uh, landlocked or political locked countries, you can observe that all these countries have a lower living condition, a lower income per capita than other countries in the world. And if something happens within this country, for example, a drought uh, for agricultural produce, then the prices are running up, they are exploding. And then there is no import from other regions uh, which can benefit from higher prices to uh, uh, run these prices again down. And so the observ uh, observation is that in many landlocked countries, the, the volatility of product prices, it's much higher than in those countries where you have open trade. So this is, uh, trade is balancing, is stabilizing the market situation worldwide. And the more countries uh, are engaged in a free trade situation like the WTO, uh, the smaller is the, uh, the, uh, the destabilization. So this is my, t is my first preference to stabilize prices. Nevertheless, I would admit we have in Germany, for example, and in the European Union, we have uh, extreme low milk and meat prices. Uh, 
and farmers and the, the meat uh, processing and milk processing industries uh, complaining about that. And the government and the EU Commission has decided to give some uh, money transfers to these farmers. Not to intervene directly in the market, but to help the farmers to get uh, some uh, fresh money for investment or to to survive these uh, low price situation, uh, giving uh, money directly to the farmers and not to intervene in the market or in the price formation process. I think this is one of the possibilities uh, where the government can help to stabilize the situation, the income situation. This is important uh, to look at the income situation and not uh, only on the price situation because the income is what matters for the farmers and not the price itself. Yeah. Ну и последний вопрос. Какова роль международного сотрудничества в обеспечении устойчивого развития и борьбы с продовольственными проблемами? На чем она должна основываться и какие, к какому типу сотрудничества следует стремиться сейчас в мире? Yeah, uh, how do we call it, the last agreement, uh, WTO, the round, the Doha round is still uh, running. We have no decision uh, of this Doha round at the moment because so many countries are involved, I think more than 160, and we have a, a decision rule that every country has to admit and uh, to agree what, uh, what is happening. So the, there is a long, long uh, time of discussing and we have no end at the moment. The consequence of, of this is that we have so-called regional blocks, regional free trade ag agreements which are flourishing in Africa and uh, Russia has done something with Kazakhstan and Ukraine formerly and uh, uh, Belarus and so on and so forth and uh, even the European Union is uh, trying to uh, make some regional blocks with South Africa and with the Mercosur countries in Latin America and we have some a big uh, block very recently established between the USA China, Japan and some developing countries, I think Thailand and Vietnam and Cambodia, but I'm not quite sure. And so they are, they are uh, uh, an increasing part of regional uh, free trade areas. So altogether this is certainly a, a good tendency, uh, this international cooperation on the trade side. But we have to broaden this also to the investment side because uh, we have this very bad word of I don't know whether you have ever heard this, land grabbing. Land grabbing is uh, something, uh, in, in other words, in economic terms, this means uh, large-scale land acquisitions of China in Africa, for example, or Saudi Arabia in Africa, where they buy or rent land from the government. The problem is uh, uh, that sometimes the local people are uh, thrown away and they are not uh, engaged and not, cannot participate in this, uh, in this business and this contract. On the other side, we have also very good experiences because know-how come into the country. Uh, perhaps salaries are increased a little bit and the infrastructure is, um, uh, is improved. So uh, one cannot say at, uh, at the advance that this is bad or good, but we have very good uh, experience. And many uh, people are critical about land grabbing. I do not, I do not like this word. Uh, I say uh, foreign direct investments. And we have to make some uh, prudent rules internationally how to uh, avoid these negative aspects of uh, foreign direct investment. And uh, if we have such rules, I think this is a very good tool to improve the development of countries. Professor Schmitz, I thank you very much for your I thank you very much for your interesting questions. Uh, I'm pretty sure I have not uh, answered all the details, uh, but uh, I think it was an interesting talk, and thank you very much. And whenever you need some more information, please contact me. Uh, perhaps I can help. Спасибо. Напомню, что сегодня мы беседовали с Михаилом Шмидцем, доктором экономических наук, профессором Института аграрной политики и рыночных исследователей Гиссенского университета. До скорых встреч.